thank you, Southgate, for the privilege of coming and sharing God's word with you this morning. And uh, for this title, uh, Hope as an Anchor. Now, when I first um, kind of got given the choice of a, a number of weeks, I kind of jumped at this passage thinking that's a great passage uh, uh, to have a look at. And uh, but actually, when I got to uh, reading the verses around it, I started to struggle a little bit, I must confess. But having spent um, uh, a, a couple of weeks trying to uh, get my head around Hebrews a little bit more, uh, which is not a book I've explored a massive amount, I must confess, other than those most popular and well known parts of Hebrews about faith in uh, chapter 11 and, and other maybe uh, little verses. I didn't really understand the full context of what was going on here. So um, hopefully now I can set these verses in their correct kind of context and hopefully we'll, we'll get um, a lot out of this morning. Okay, so you should have on your screen now, Hope as an Anchor from Hebrews 6 verses 9 to 20. Now, I know that you're up in Suffolk, I'm down in Essex, but actually I was born in Norfolk, and because of that, I am a big Norwich City fan, which, of course, coming to a church in uh, Suffolk is potentially a risk. But I want to tell you a story this morning relating to, to uh, my love of Norwich City, um, which has some relevance to what I'm going to speak on this morning. And I want to take you back to February the 28th, 2005, and it is half time in a Premier League football match between Norwich and Manchester City. Norwich have spent nine years trying to get back into the Premier League, but unfortunately the season is not going too well. Norwich are next to bottom in the league table. The fans are starting to lose heart. The players that they worship and make sacrifices to and follow don't seem to be delivering. The once vocal crowds are much quieter. Some are questioning their continuing support and are considering staying away. The glory of the Premier League that they've reached now not delivering for them. Enter Delia Smith, majority shareholder and passionate Norwich City fan. And in just a few words at half time on a microphone, which sadly she'll be forever remembered for, she addresses the crowd with words similar to, you're the greatest football supporters in the world. Where are you? Let's be having you. It's a rallying cry to her fellow Norwich City fans, to her fellow worshippers. In essence, she is saying, no matter how things look right now, we need to stand together. We need to believe together. We need to not throw in the towel and we need to show to everyone that we have hope. Well, what has the, on earth has that got to do with today's passage? Well, the letter to the Hebrews is written to a group of Jewish Christians. Jews who had accepted Jesus Christ, possibly converted as part of the early church through the teaching after Pentecost. And they were a group of believers who had started well. They had an enthusiastic faith and they were not ashamed of it. And they had a hope which they professed and a confidence in Jesus Christ. But things had begun to go wrong. These once faithful believers in Jesus and in the new covenant were starting to wane in their faith. These Jewish Christians appear to be facing opposition and persecution. They're beginning to doubt their faith in Jesus and they are re risking returning to their Jewish ways. After all, Judaism offered them something visible, something tangible. And it would mean that if they gave up what they had now, they were less likely to face trials and persecution and life would be a little bit better for them. Something that they could see was becoming preferable to something that required faith in the unseen. 
And these Jewish Christians are cited by the writer as being despondent, losing their enthusiasm for their faith, failing to grow. They're stopping attending Christian meetings, stopping having fellowship, drifting from what they've heard, and they are in danger of abandoning their faith altogether. They had a very straightforward choice, life with Jesus or life without him. Now, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but it is clear from the beginning of the letter, they set out clearly the superiority of Jesus Christ and the new covenant. The writer demonstrates that Jesus, the son of God, the one that they have put their faith in, is incomparable to the old covenant, the old system to which these readers are potentially in danger of returning to. And in the first five chapters of Hebrews, the writer shows how Jesus, who they had put their faith in, was greater than angels, greater than Moses, greater than the system of the high priests. You see, this old order was imperfect and provisional. Jesus brings something perfect and something eternal. And having set out the superiority of Jesus at the beginning, sorry, having set out the superiority of Jesus, at the beginning of chapter six, the writer to the Hebrews has their Delia Smith moment. And he or she has this rallying call to a group of despondent followers of Jesus who are starting to give up starting to drift, questioning whether to believe, wondering whether to give up altogether. And the writer is really quite firm with them. He reminds them that they have tasted a heavenly gift. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of God. And he says, come on, let's be having you. Stand for Jesus. If you turn back, you will never share in his glory. And that brings us to where Sue read for us from this morning, verse 9. These believers are discouraged and they need uh, encouragement. They're not being deliberately rebellious, but they are losing their way. They need reminding of the hope that they have in Jesus, an eternal and glorious hope, not something that's just a vain possibility. And of course, as we've been reminded this morning, we're in days at the moment that can feel a bit discouraging. And we can be tempted, even as God's people, to lose our way, to wonder if God is really there, to question our faith, to take a different path or we can be encouraged by the words of the reader of the writer sorry that we have an incomparable hope in Jesus Christ and I see in these verses three encouragements concerning the hope that we have we have a hope that means we are not forgotten we have a hope in the reliability of God's promises, and we have a hope that it is. So let's have a look at the hope first that means we are not. And we see this in verses 9 to 12. And it says this, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The writer to the Hebrews encourages these believers that they are not forgotten by God. On a human level, any sense of being forgotten 
would leave someone feeling discouraged. I googled for quotes on um, being forgotten and this was the top one that came out. The worst feeling is not being lonely, it's being forgotten by someone you would never forget. God will never forget us. On more than one occasion in the Bible it says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And indeed it comes from this very book that we're looking at this morning in chapter 13 of Hebrews. Julie has mentioned uh, Psalm 139 this morning, and I already had it down as well. Um, and he hems us in behind and before. The all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God, also ever present. One of my favourite verses um, in the Bible, and I have a few, but this is one of them says, I will not forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's an incredible thought, that your name and my name is engraved on the palms of God's hands. That's how close we are to him. He would look at his hands and see our name. A few years ago, I had a really bad habit of writing things on the back of my hand in order to help me remember. And um, although it wasn't a very good habit, it always meant that I never forgot things because they were that close to me. Every time I turned my hand up to look at my, my watch to see the time, there would be the reminders of the things I needed to do. How much greater is the fact that we are engraved, permanent, on the hands of God? Verse 10 says that God is not unjust. If God forgot about you or the people that were being written to here in this letter, he would be exactly that, unjust. God is not and never will be unjust. Verse 10 goes on to say, he will not forget your work, your love for him and the help you've given others. Maybe some of you today feel a sense of being abandoned by God, forgotten by him. Maybe you feel you've served him well in the church or, or on an individual level, but you're not appreciated or things are not changing for you. Well, be encouraged today that God sees God knows and God has not forgotten you. And we need to keep living in this hope. The readers are reminded not to become sluggish or lazy, but to keep going in the hope that they have. And it's the same for us too. We must live for and serve God no matter what comes our way. These believers are encouraged to, to, to keep on going to the end, even under their struggles of suffering and persecution and discouragement. The writer tells them to hang in there. And in verse 12, he indicates how they're to do that. He says, imitate those who through faith and patience have inherited what has been promised. Good role models are important in life, but God's role models are even better. And Abraham, one such example, someone who through faith and patience inherited God's. And that brings us to our second point. The hope that we have is in the reliability of God's promises. In verses 13 to 18, we read this. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received. 
Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. The writer to the Hebrews points his readers to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, someone they would have been well acquainted with in their previous walk in the Jewish faith. And Abraham was a man of faith. At the age of 75, and at the word of God, he ups and leaves his homeland. And he does everything God tells him to. God had promised him that he would be a great nation and all people on earth would be blessed through him. But of course, Abraham had no son. And it was 25 years before his son Isaac was born to him. Abraham showed incredible faith and enduring patience, and God was as good as his word. Abraham even obeyed God when he tested him to take the one and only son he had given him, the one who, with, through whom all nations would be blessed, the very person who God would bring those multiple descendants he had promised, when he asks him to go and sacrifice his own son, Abraham goes to do that act. And when God sees Abraham's faith, he stepped in. When God made his promise to Abraham, he swore by himself that his promise would be fulfilled. He made a promise and he gave an oath. Verse 16 in our passage this morning says, men swear by someone greater than themselves. Oath confirms what is said. I spent 31 years in the police and I spent an awful lot of time giving evidence in court. And of course, when you stand up in court and you take an oath, you take an oath on a holy book, Say, I swear by Almighty God, tell the truth, the whole truth, or nothing but the truth. I can swear by something greater than myself. But God could not swear by someone greater than himself when he made a promise to Abraham. So he swears by himself. What God is saying to Abraham is, so that you know my promise is true, I'll swear with an oath. I will swear by myself. I'm going to put my character and my integrity on the line. And God keeps his promise to Abraham. Because as verse 18 then says, it is impossible for God to lie. God's promise to us is that he sends Jesus into the world to be our saviour, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And that promise is reliable because God cannot lie. He swears by himself. If we draw near to him, he draws near to us. He will never turn away anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. The Hebrew readers had initially left behind their old way of Jewish life with its rituals and had taken hold of this new hope in Jesus and the new covenant. And through this example of God's promise to Abraham, the writer says, you can be greatly encouraged because the same unchanging God of Abraham will come through on his promise to you. The promise of forgiveness and eternal life. And the writer says, don't slip away. Don't give in. Don't go back to your old ways. 
be encouraged. You are not forgotten. And the promises of God that you have received are wholly reliable. And then finally, the writer paints a picture that shows to the readers and to us our hope is secure. Verses 19 and 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The hope we have in God is like an anchor. Not a physical anchor, but as the writer describes it, as an anchor for the soul. Life will not always be easy. We've all at some point felt like we've been thrown about in a storm for all sorts of reasons. You may feel like that right now because God's people are not immune. In my role as a pastoral care worker, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this a lot. I'm seeing it in the lives of the people I look out for and care for. The illustration of our hope being like an anchor is a powerful one for us. And it certainly would have been for the readers of this letter. Let me tell you three things about anchors. Number one, when the storms are rough, the anchor digs deeper. A physical anchor, when it's dropped into the sea, will hold fast on the seabed. But when the storms start to hit the boat, it becomes unstable. And buffeted around, the anchor will dig in even more. What a reassuring picture. When life is tough for us, when the storms are swirling around us, the hope we have this hope in God digs in even deeper. And it's a hope that will, over time, bring stability and calm once again. Secondly, an anchor is only useful when it's out of sight. An anchor does nothing till it's dropped overboard and can't be seen. No anchor is useful up on the deck of a boat or a ship. It needs to be put into the water. These Jewish Christians were tempted to give up on their faith and go back to living by what they could see. The physical sacrifices and the worship. They were maybe struggling to live with what they could not see. But we're reminded in God's word that we live by faith, not by sight. Thirdly, an anchor is no use unless it's connected to the ship. We need to be connected to Jesus. because He is our hope. And if we've become disconnected in someone, we need to reestablish that connection. A ship's anchor goes down. Our anchor goes up into heavenly places where Jesus is. We can't see the anchor in heaven, but we do know when we're connected because we will have that sure and steady reassurance of God in our life. The writer tells his readers, our hope enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. And the inner sanctuary was, of course, the Holy of Holies, where under the Jewish system, a high priest could enter once a year to offer sacrifices for the people's sins and seek forgiveness. It was repeated year after year. No one could even glimpse into the Holy of Holies. But Jesus our great high priest, through his death and resurrection, not only enters the very presence of God, but has made it possible for us to go there too. We can know God 
our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. And this is the hope that these Jewish Christians were being reassured of, and it is our hope too. It's a secure hope. And if we remain connected to it, then our faith in Jesus will see us safely home into our promised eternity. I want to share, I hope we've got enough time to share just a few questions to reflect on. And I'd like to play a song in a moment for you to listen to and think about these questions as you listen. Do you have an anchor in Jesus Christ? Is your hope beginning to wane and you feel God's forgotten you? Do you need to reach out and take hold of God's promises again? Are you rejoicing in the security of your hope? Is there someone you know who needs to know that renewed hope for themselves? Hopefully one of those questions has resonated with you and as we come to the end of this time together. I thank you that you have not forgotten any one of us. I thank you that your promises are reliable. I thank you that we are secure in the hope we have in you. Father, I pray for anybody this morning who's watching this and listening in to what you're saying. I pray, Lord, that you would give hope to those who have no hope. To those, Lord, who are yet to find faith in you, I pray that this would be a turning point for them. Those, Lord, who feel forgotten and are wondering where you are in this whole pandemic, Lord, I pray that they would have their hope renewed in you. For Lord, those for those that are struggling, Lord, I pray that you will uh, bring bring us alongside them, and that you would help us to speak your hope into their lives.